Daniel Faber, the CEO with Orbit Fab. Thanks for joining us on Australia and Space TV. Thanks, Trish. Great to be here. Uh, you're based there in Colorado, but uh, you're an Australian-born, uh, well, space entrepreneur, really. So it's a very interesting story. Uh, one thing, well, one thing I wanted to cover is your background, how you found yourself there in the US. But Orbit Fab uh, is backed by Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin. Looks like a very interesting company as well. We might just start with Orbit Fab, uh, a bit of a background in terms of your recent funding uh, and your current projects, and then we'll kind of delve into your background. That sounds great. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about, about Orbit Fab. Yeah, sure. Excellent. So uh, Orbit Fab, I mean, the, the tagline is gas stations in space. We we haven't trademarked petrol stations in space, but I, <laughs> I prefer it if we could. Um, we set this up five years ago when, when people thought the idea of refueling satellites was crazy. Um, there were no like tow trucks in space. And basically when you, you launch a satellite, all, right, all that communications and GPS and, and like weather and remote sensing and everything else. So it's amazing how much space touches all of those satellites, they get launched with one tank of fuel. And when it's gone, that's it. Like that's the end of the satellite. You have to get rid of it. Otherwise it's just careening around. Like you can't keep it in the right spot. You can't coordinate it with other satellites. It's a, it's a, a um, collision hazard. So you have to get rid of it and put it into a, into a safe place. So the biggest, like the only consumable on satellites is fuel. 85% of satellites have to get deorbited because they run out of fuel. And yet everybody designs with like that, that, one paradigm, you've just got to have fuel, that's it. Um, and so we came along and said, well, what if you refuel? And everyone's like, no, don't be crazy. We've, we've got really good at designing for one tank of fuel. We don't need you. Uh, and that's the yeah, classic, classic paradigm. So we had to sort of shift that. And, uh, and so it's been a fun journey in these five years. When we started, there were seven or eight companies that were trying to build, like we call them tow trucks in space yeah. for repairs or upgrades or, or moving satellites between orbits, inspecting them, like to, pulling them out of orbit. There were eight companies. Now there are over 120 companies trying to build these tow trucks in space. So the whole idea that you could grapple another satellite or, or approach it and do something interesting with it, that has really, like, its time has come. And we were at the back going, well, we don't really want to do any of that. We just want to refuel the satellites. How about we refuel the tow trucks? And that's really, like, resonated with all of those companies as well. So we can extend the life of the tow truck. Otherwise, you launch a tow truck, it uses a lot of fuel to tow another satellite or get to the yeah, satellite. Yeah. The first thing you're going to do is run out of fuel and throw away your tow truck. Uh, so we have to make all those different models. Well, I've got a couple of questions on what type of fuel are we talking about? Is it is it gas or uh, sort of, yeah, tell us about what type of fuel, because I take it you might have different kinds of, uh, of fuel or energy sources? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple that are most popular, hydrazine and, and xenon. Uh, hydrazine is a, it's a pretty toxic chemical, um, but it burns with itself. So you put it on a catalyst and it, and it just combusts. Um, so that's great, like all the energy stored in the in the chemical bonds. Uh, so you get the energy out real quick. It gives you a very high thrust. Um, but then the the other one is is xenon, which is a noble gas, right? There's no chemical energy stored there. You have to use electricity to put the energy into it. But right. you can put it in a particle accelerator, basically, and, and throw it out the back at extremely high speed. So you get incredible fuel efficiency out of xenon. But still, it's it's a consumable, and when it's done, it's done. So they still need to be resupplied with xenon. So those are the two that that people are using right now. And you've got a partnership with Astra Scale uh, as well. Where's the project at? You, have you launched anything or you've got prototypes that are being tested and proven? Yeah, Astra Scale is a great company. They're originally Japanese. They've, they've got US and, and UK uh, branches as well. And their US group are working on a geostationary satellite life extension vehicles. So they attach to these satellites and act like a jetpack to take over the thrusters. And they've said, well, can you refuel the jetpack? That's basically been the question. So they signed up to, to buy a lot of fuel for their fleet of life extension vehicles. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, working closely with them, they're helping us with rendezvous docking technologies. Um, they've also, we're, we're working with them in the UK on debris removal. So they'll grab debris and remove it. So that's another aspect that they're working on. Um, so yeah, a lot of close relationships with AstraScale. Uh, they've recently raised a, a huge amount of money uh, to, to pull those things off. The Japanese government have got behind them as a, as a great solution. And yeah, we're just we're just riding on that and supporting them. And you've got Rafty, so you do have a, a product that you've created. Uh, maybe tell us where Rafty's at. Yeah, when we when we started five years ago, we realised that the, the satellites don't have petrol caps. Uh, there's, there's no way to get the fuel into the satellite when they're in space. They have valves yeah. they use on they the ground. They weren't designed that way, right? They basically they basically weld them shut, right? They put caps and lock wire and what have you. So we said, look, we've got to design 
a fuel cap that that you could get fuel in and somehow you've either got a dock at the fuel cap or provide some sort of force latching mechanism so we went and surveyed I don't know, 30 or 40 customers at the time. We've now got up to 200 or more customers that we've talked to about what they'd like to see in this fueling port. And we combine that with our vision of a low cost refueling architecture in space. And that sort of gave us the design parameters. And we built now a petrol cap. So we're a petrol cap company at the at the heart of it. We're, we're selling those. And uh, um, you know, they're, they're the kind of thing you just put on a satellite in place of these, of these valves they had before, but it gives you that option to be refueled in space. Got it. So... That's kind of right now our primary primary thing. And then as more and more satellites get into orbit, of course, we then see more contracts to delivering them fuel. And are you manufacturing that? Are you manufacturing in the US? Yeah, we are. We're we're looking though at um, contract manufacturing it. So we don't want to be the sole source of supply. A lot of the customers are get, it makes them nervous. So yeah. we're like, okay, we can we can license this to other folks to to manufacture as well. So that's the plan. We'll probably manufacture it in the in the UK. Uh, because or Europe, because they want to buy something made in Europe, all that works as well. Anything to to speed up the adoption of these fueling ports, so that then there's just an ecosystem of folks we can we can refuel. And is there any prototype designs for, let's say, your your refueling truck? Uh, how big that may be, and what kind of orbit? And I take it you'd be able to move that in and out of uh, different orbits. But yeah, how how big would that be? Yeah, we we size the well, the architecture consists of, of fuel shuttles, which can deliver the fuel. Um, so you can come to a fuel shuttle if you want to do that, but it can go to you as well. Right. Um, and then the fuel shuttles are sized based on how much fuel our customers will need. Uh, and sometimes it's not a lot because people haven't been used to using fuel. They're very economical with it. Yep. Um, so they're, they're fairly modest sized vehicles, like a, a few hundred kilos. And then fuel depots, which we use to launch as much fuel. So when a fuel shuttle runs out of its fuel, it can go and refuel from a depot. And they're sized as big as we can get on a rocket to, to get to space uh, as cheaply as possible. So that's the architecture, fuel depots and fuel shuttles. And so far, we've launched one fuel depot into orbit. So that's been in orbit for about a year and a half. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's there sort of waiting for us to come and get the fuel out of it. We're right now developing the first of the fuel shuttles, and we've got to launch January next year. So... We start to deploy both ends of that architecture. Nice. How does the, the business case work? You know, the money being saved from launching satellites and putting a new satellite up versus the refueling. I imagine you've done the business case. Uh, yeah, what kind of savings are there, or particularly on the sustainability of space as well? Yeah, it's absolutely staggering. When you, when you think about it, right, you're not reusing a satellite. You throw it away as soon as it's out of fuel. Yeah. The only way to keep serving those customers is to launch a completely new satellite. So we went around to a lot of folks before we started the company and just said, what would it be worth if there was fuel in space? Like how much value would it be if you had another another kilo of fuel? And we were absolutely gobsmacked by the answers. So many people said they would see over a million dollars of extra revenue for every kilogram of fuel they could have. It, it blew my mind because we know the launch yeah. company. We know we could get a deal to launch to orbit for maybe $1,000 a kilo, maybe even less, which means there's three orders of magnitude arbitrage. And that's that's a good trade. So we decided we could probably fit a business in that. After we heard that like the seventh or eighth time, that that kind of value creation, we're like, all right, let's stop everything else we're doing. Let's double down and let's start the company. We've got to we've got to make this happen. Turns out, as it, there's a lot of reasons, it's pretty complicated standing up this business. But yeah, we we make it work. It's it's going to create a huge amount of value for the space industry. Well, I think that's why that comes to your background. You're an entrepreneur and you're involved in a range of different sort of ventures. Uh, and uh, we mentioned you're a Tasmanian born uh, in, here in yeah. Australia. What's been your journey along the way? Because I think that gives you a bit of, or well, the audience, a bit of scope into how you found yourself there in Colorado. Yeah, I, uh, I went to university in Sydney and, and started doing mechanical engineering. And I was thinking about, you know, what I'm going to do with my career. I decided that getting humans off Earth is, is probably going to be the, the most monumental uh, advance for humanity. And, and so... I wrote down a list of industries that could pay for the first permanent jobs in space, deciding that, yeah, there's, there's no space. There was no space agency in Australia back then. I'd have to figure something yeah. out myself. And, and that list, after a lot of thinking, contained only two industries. It was tourism and mining. Um, so I decided I'd have a go at asteroid mining. So I went around the world, built a dozen satellites in Canada, US, Europe. Uh, and uh, you know, last time there was an Australian space research program, I came back for a year or two and, and we did some super interesting things, the technology. But always it's been things around this idea of, well, what if we can get to asteroid mining? Um, I've now made a longer list of things that might pay for the first permanent jobs in space, effectively exports from space. Um, 
but it's uh, it's really through that that process of looking at what we might mine from asteroids i realized hey the first thing you'll sell is propellant for delivery in earth orbit because that's worth more than the metals that you might be able to get out to sell on the ground right. so i started building thrusters that could run off the material you could get out of an asteroid and that led to these questions of well how much is fuel in orbit worth and when we realized how much it was worth we're like okay let's let's not worry about the fuels that that can can be made out of asteroids until later right let's worry about that in the future let's just figure out how to create a market for the fuels that we can launch from the ground. And that's how, that's how we got to orbit fab. Uh, so in order to work in the U S it's, it's not so easy. You've got to have uh, at least definitely it used to be that you had to have the right paperwork because everything that goes to space was, was classified as a, as a dual use uh, yeah. you know, potential military use. Uh, and so I founded my last company and got the co-founders to do the paperwork, to get me into the U S to work on that. <laughs> Less than 12 months later, the U.S. government changed the rules and took half of space tech off the list. But by then, I'd, I'd finally made it in. So, uh, so yeah, sort of long and uh, an arduous journey. The U.S. is country number seven. But I'll be honest, I'm, I'm here because it's where the biggest market is. It's where most of the money is. It's where the talent is. This is a great place to get this kind of a business right on the edge of the possible off the ground. And so, uh, yeah, I moved to Colorado for a similar reason. It's got the workforce. It's got Space Force and like a big concentration of aerospace contractors. And uh, and suppliers, which you know, frankly are our customers, so good place to be, and it's and it's really pretty as well. Well, hopefully we'll be there in April for the uh, for the conference. Um, the you mentioned asteroids and asteroid mining. You must have been excited by some of the developments on asteroids uh, over the last sort of twelve to eighteen months. Do you think we're going to eventually get there? Uh, you know, we can change the orbits of asteroids now. Um, yeah, what, what's your recent observations uh, on that uh, on those developments? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's, it's inevitable. It's just a matter of timing. I know I've been I've been working on this for twenty five years. It's now twenty five years closer. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to be though. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, but uh, the last company I ran was Deep Space Industries. So our big hairy audacious goal was asteroid mining. Um, we ended up executing on a technology strategy to build the thrusters that could run off that material, and uh, and that was sold to a European company for the thruster technology. It was it was adopted into quite a number of satellite constellations. And so sort of being around all of those pieces as we look at it, but we did a mine plan for, uh, for an asteroid. We, we did look at the, the mineralogy and, and the rock mechanics and these kind of things and sketched out from a mining engineering perspective and a mining business perspective, where are the big gaps? What needs to change? And you're right, what's happened in the, in the last few years, we've learned so much more about an asteroid. We've touched the asteroids a few times and discovered that most of the time they're actually really fragile. Right. If we have gone up with hard rock mining equipment, you put that into a rock that's basically a, a pile of rubble or sand, you really wouldn't have come away with anything. So it's a good yeah. thing we didn't send that equipment up there. <laughs> These are the kind of things we have to learn. Right. And that's where every sample we bring back, every time we touch an asteroid, we're learning new things. The most exciting mission on the books at the moment is a, a mission to, to Psyche, which is a metal type asteroid. And no one's ever visited those before. We have meteorites that match the spectrum that are just solid nickel iron alloy. And so they're speculating, is this just the entire like former core of a protoplanet or something that got smashed apart in an impact? Yeah. It's just an, an enormous block of, of stainless steel floating around in space. Or is it a mix of stainless steel and rock? Or you know, does it have splash marks? Can you? Is it a pile of sand? Like, What in the world does this thing look like? Maybe it's a bunch of iron filings. Nobody has any idea. So everything that we see there is going to be a first. It's, it's not going to fit almost any model that any scientist has. That's, that's been the, the norm for, uh, for space exploration is for the first time you go to something, just expect it to be different than what you imagine. I was going to say, so that's, that's, that's part of the challenge movie. now. Yeah, that's it's part right. of the challenge now, isn't it? Everything's going to be different uh, and we're going to continue to learn. What's your general observations of the industry, the space industry, and potentially back to the Australian space industry uh, what's your observations there and uh, sort of the highlights for you? Yeah, hugely accelerating. A uh, couple of different things on that. One is just the cost of doing things has come down. Launch is cheaper. Spacecraft can be smaller because you know, electronics are, are shrinking and becoming more powerful. So there's more opportunity for commercial businesses to get stood up. And you can do experiments with new business models a lot cheaper. And one of the reasons software is so attractive to VC is because you can do a, a, an experiment for almost free, yeah. put something out there and just publish it and see if people use it. In space, it's always been like, how many tens of millions of dollars have you had before you even get to your first product test? So that's 
the big thing is the cost of doing a product test has come down dramatically. So we're seeing a lot more potential commercial applications all the way up to commercial space stations, tourism, entertainment content. Tom Cruise is shooting a movie in space. People are looking to do manufacturing of both medical things, of, uh, of pharmaceuticals, uh, of, of exotic materials, of, of um, carbon, not carbon fiber, um, um, fiber for, for undersea cables, all these kinds of things that are just sort of trying to crack the edge of what's possible in space. So all of that is huge. At the same time, the traditional space industry run by the governments based on national sort of um, national security and, and strategic concerns, that's only doubling down in the current environment. So yeah. both of these are huge headwinds to the industry. And Australia has stepped into this for both of those reasons, right? New Zealand has a rocket program. Australia really should have a space agency. That's what it took to get to get over the, the line on the civil program. But then the government is also investing heavily as a partner of the US in, in a lot of those kind of programs. And so on both sides, Australia is sort of well positioned as a, a nation that everybody likes to work with and is friendly. Uh, very high-tech, uh, well-educated workforce. So the opportunity is there for Australia to, to find its niche. And that's really, I think, going to be the challenge for people working in Australia. What's the niche? What's the thing that Australia can do? What's it going to build up as a capability that it can then sell to the rest of the world? And what, what do you think that could be, uh, Daniel, in terms of either skill sets or technology itself? Uh, do you see any highlights there from the Australian space industry early that we could focus on? Yeah, I think if you take a vision of where the industry is going to go and you look forward you know, 20 to 40 years, we're going to have uh, people living in space, tourism and, and everything else. We're going to have like most industries that are happening on Earth are going to move to space. Um, there's, there's going to be power generation. There's going to be um, hospitals. There's going to be so many different things, um, mining, agriculture uh, as well. And so when you look at it, Australia could invest in any of those things, but leveraging Australia's current sort of expertise and advantages, uh, what, what is that? We're definitely very good at communications uh, and communication systems and, and those kinds of things. Anything sort of uh, radio, RF, very strong capabilities. Mining, of course, and all aspects of that mining uh, chain. Um, yeah, agriculture, it's, it's further out. You need the people in space to be the market. But these are the kind of things that Australia could invest in such that in the long term, we have a dominant position. But it takes a vision to say, look, here's where we see the future. And here are, we should be a bit of a portfolio, right? Here are a number of things that we can invest in that no one else has got ahead of yet, that we could absolutely own and everybody gets there. Um, you know, we could take a, a leadership in, a role in that. And then you back that up with um, some early funding, some policy, some market creation, uh, and some international sort of diplomacy and horse trading on the government program so that it's our systems that are in there. When the commercial picks that up, then you're in a huge uh, a huge advantage. Um, maybe just to finish off, things like the Australia-UK Space Bridge, uh, AUKUS, are you seeing noises there that might assist you uh, being either having an Australian accent? Uh, you're obviously a US company, but do you find that there's any benefits there coming through to you in relation to that kind of those partnerships or those discussions? Yeah, we've just hired somebody in the UK to uh, to help with that, and and we've looked at how we're working with with all the other partners because national security concerns are are global now, um, and so that's just just sort of natural that that we'll be playing into that as we as we support some of those activities. Um, but yeah, being an Australian, uh, it, it's always better to be local wherever you're trying to to do your business. Uh, it helps. I'm I'm Australian. I also lived in Canada long enough and uh, and became Canadian. So I find it very easy to, to work in Canada as well. Um, yeah, that's, it definitely doesn't hurt. Wonderful. Well, look, uh, Daniel, what's your sort of a highlight for 2023? What would the audience be looking out for when they're seeing Orbit Fab? Last year was the uh, partnership with AstroScale. Yeah, highlights for, for this year or the immediate uh, future for you? Yeah, there's going to be a lot happening. We've got uh, new missions going up to test the rendezvous docking technology. In fact, there are several companies that are doing uh, tests around that. And rendezvous docking, like if we want a bustling in space economy, you've got to figure out how to bustle. Right? You've got to figure out how to approach things and dock. So watch out for that for this year, both both from us and, and other companies. And then, of course, yeah, we've just got a lot of, of business stuff lined up that we'll be talking about and new contracts and new deals, uh, building hardware uh, and winning business. The company structure, your private company, can people invest in you? Uh, private company, only qualified investors can invest. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we're, we're open to that. Um, one day we might go public and that'll open it up to everybody else. 
Wonderful. Well, it's orbitfab.com. I'll put the link in the show notes. But Daniel Faber there in Colorado, uh, just outside of Denver. Thank you very much for joining us on Australia in Space TV. Thanks, Chris. Great to be here.